Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Clinical Trials Methodology Course webinar series. Today's webinar is on good clinical practice. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to remind you that if you have a question, please use the chat box to the right of your screen, or you can simply unmute yourself. Also, at the end of the webinar today, please take a moment to, to evaluate the webinar, and I will provide the link at the end of the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Um, we have two. Uh, it's Dixie Eklund and Marianne Kearney Chase. Dix Dixie Eklund is the Director of Operations at the Clinical Trials Statistical and Data Management Center at the University of Iowa. She has over 30 years of combined experience in conducting clinical trials through the CTSDMC, and it's her previous and in her previous role as nurse manager of the General Clinic Research Center. She has been involved in various capacities and hundreds of clinical trials ranging from small phase one studies to multi-center phase three studies. Ms. Eklund has served as an IRB member for over 25 years and was appointed an IRB chair in 2009. She has administrative experience with re responsibilities, including protocol implementation, protocol compliance, resource allocation, budgetary impl implications, and collaboration with many partners. Mary Ann Curie Chase is the Director of Research Operations at the Neurological Clinical Research Institute. She has over 25 years of experience working in both industry and academia on investigator-initiated trials, including with NIH, various foundations, and industry sponsors. Ms. Chase um, has a wide variety of experience with study coordination, site management, protocol development, regulatory compliance, and project management. Currently oversees 25-plus um, protocol managers and administrative staff in her role at NCRI and providing regulatory and site management expertise, as well as overseeing all ongoing clinical research trials managed by the group. So thank you both for agreeing to present today. I'm gonna to hand it over to, I believe, um, is Dixie going first? No, um, it's me. <laughs> Mar Marianne, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Joy. And, and uh, welcome to everybody to the lecture today. Um, so what Dixie and I are gonna be talking about is good clinical practices. Um, which I'm sure you've all heard a lot about good clinical practice through your, through your research careers. Um, sorry, slide. Uh, slides are not advancing. There we go. Okay, um, so again, good clinical practice, um, you know, it's, a, it's really the most essential thing in, in clinical research, um, and we like to sort of bring everybody back to this point. Um, GCP is, we do it for so many different reasons, and, and one of the main ones is really to, to make sure that your study is being done in compliance with all the different regulations. Um, so there are regulations put out by the FDA, which are, you know, here in, in one box. You know, they have many regulations about how clinical trials can be conducted and how the data is collected and how they're reviewed. Um, there are the Department of Health and Human Services also has a lot of regulations about IRBs and informed consent and, and how patients are protected. Um, and then there are international guidelines as well. So the International Conference on Harmonization has, has um, uh, regulations as well. So all of them point to GCP, and, and if you follow good clinical practice, you'll be in compliance with all of these different regulations. So why are why is there so much regulation in clinical trials? Uh, great question. Um, so really, it's it's the main points in good clinical practice is you want to ensure the the right safety and well-being of human subjects that are participating in research. So um, that that is the underlying principle of all all good clinical practice and all clinical trial regulations. Um, and the other one is really to um, regulate how we collect data, right? So to, to provide useful scientific data to improve or change the standard of care. So we want to make sure that we're protecting patients and then we're collecting good quality, high quality data um, on any of the trials we do so that if a product gets out into the market, we, we know that from a scientific standpoint, uh, that the results have been, have been validated. So good clinical practices um, are the standard for, is that they set the standard for the design, the conduct, performance, monitoring, auditing, recording, and, and analyzing and reporting of clinical trials. So it's really, you know, soup to nuts. It's from you, when you first think about a trial, you have to think about how, does, how do you have to comply with good clinical practice, all the way through reporting results. Um, and again, the, the two key points are making sure that you have the patients protected and the, the um, 
accuracy of results protected. So I mentioned earlier about the International Conference on Harmonization. So this is an international body. Many trials are conducted globally. Um, so this was a group uh, that got together um, that set requirements for uh, obtaining drug approvals in the U.S., Europe, and Japan, and it's used by many nations now. Um, so typically when you think about the International Conference on Harmonization, they refer to what is Section E6 about good clinical practice. Um, that was established first in 1996. It's been revised more recently in, in 2016. Um, and some of the slides that I'll present have some notation of some of the new revisions that were added. Um, some of those revisions really had to do with, you know, sort of, you know, changing some of the how we approach clinical trial design and how we approach all of these different areas. And, and a big area of change had to do with, you know, adding some supplemental guidance on how to do risk-based monitoring and um, more on data integrity and quality management. Because um, you can imagine when this was, you know, originally written back in the 90s, there wasn't as much electronic data. There was not as much, you know, uh, technology. So some of these have been able to, to uh, be revised. So this International Conference on Harmonization, the guideline, and this um, this is one that, that, you know, everyone follows. It really has eight sections. So to show you, there are multiple things in this guidance document. Um, we give you the, the overall principles of good, good clinical practice. Um, they talk about how IRBs and ethics committees need to, need to perform. Um, there are requirements for sponsors and for investigators, um, as well as the requirements for clinical trials how an investigator's brochure or all the information about a drug needs to be kept, as well as essential documents or regulatory documents and where they need to be during a trial. So what I'm going to focus my presentation on today um, is really the, the um, requirements of the sponsor, and then Dixie's going to take on the requirements of the investigator. Um, and highlighting the sponsor. Um, so, so first, Basic definitions. The sponsor means different things to different people, um, as does the word investigator. So um, the Good Clinical Practice Guideline, the ICH Guideline, gives us the definition. So a sponsor is an individual, company, institution, or an organization which takes on the responsibility for initiating, managing, and or financing a clinical trial. Um, their overall focus as a sponsor um, is it's the focus of the entire study, the overall study, um, and they have reporting responsibilities to the FDA as well as the IRB. Um, an investigator is the person responsible for conducting a clinical trial at an individual trial site, so the person enrolling patients. Um, their focus is really on, on the patients, on the subjects themselves, and implementing the protocol as written, and they have a responsibility to their local IRB or Central IRB if they're using one, um, as well as the sponsor. They do reporting directly to the sponsor. There is a definition as well of, uh, of what's called a sponsor investigator. Um, so this is a, an individual that both initiates and conducts, either alone or with others, um, the clinical trial, and under whose immediate direction the investigational product is administered to, dispensed to, and used by a subject. Um, it, they really, you know, clarify that this term does not include anyone other than the individual. So it's not a corporation. It's not a, a, your entire hospital. If you take on the obligations of a sponsor investigator in a trial, it means you hold both the responsibilities of the sponsor as well as the investigator. So all of the things that Dixie and I will review today would mean you have responsibilities for both of those and, and all of those. Um, we oftentimes like to say that it's, it's difficult to wear both hats. Um, so both being a, a, an overall sponsor, um, you know, thinking about being running and conducting the study, and especially if it's a multi-center study, difficult to do that, and to also enroll your own patients, um, it can be very challenging. So, um, so just a, a caution about that. Here, said that. Um, so academic trial sponsors, this can get confusing as well. Um, you know, there are different, as I said, different terminology about sponsors. So. From a regulatory standpoint, sponsor is the person who submits the investigational new drug application to the FDA. Um, but oftentimes there's a financial sponsor, and that's you know, usually your funding source. 
Um, so that could be NIH if you have NIH funding. It could be an industry collaborator um, who's helping to fund the study or a foundation or any other um, financing that you get. So when, when we talk in good clinical practice about the sponsor, um, we are referring to the regulatory sponsor, which is the person who submits the application to FDA. Um, that's who the, the academic trial sponsor is. A coordinating center um, is a team that assists the academic PI to fulfill all the regulatory requirements in managing your clinical study. So the coordinating center sort of helps you stay on track to make sure that you're meeting all of the requirements for good clinical practice and all the, regula uh, all the regulations. So when do these guidelines apply? Um, so these apply to all studies that are conducted in the U.S. Um, and if there's a chance of them being marketed to any of the, the other regions, um, most studies are conducted globally. Um, and it also, they apply to all studies that are conducted outside of the U.S. if they want to get approval in the U.S. So what we like to say is that all studies um, are, are uh, covered under the ICH GCP guidelines. Um, and as I said, many trials are conducted globally. Um, so this slide just gives you an overview of sort of the clinical trial process um, and the many steps. And I know at the, at the course that we were just at a couple of weeks ago, um, I know all of these er different areas were discussed, and I know you've been discussing them in small groups. Um, but just to give you a soup to not sort of all the way from study design all the way to final report, this is what we consider the clinical trial process that is regulated by uh, good clinical practice. This is the typical standard, what people say in terms of drug discovery um, as to, you know, taking a drug to market and how long it can take. Um, you know, the, the paradigm has been, you know, sort of a two to 10 years taking a drug to market. Um, and at different stages, you know, you're submitting IND applications or a new drug application and trying to go for FDA approval. Um, you know, we are usually, you know, in this course and in, in academia, we're usually in the early stages of clinical trials, um, and companies typically take it on to, um, to go to the next stage of submitting a new drug application. So to talk through some of the sponsor um, obligations, um, the first overview is quality and delegating of tasks. So it's the sponsor's responsibility. Um, to have processes in place um, and a written plan, written standard operating procedures um, on all aspects of the trial. Um, there was, you see in the red with the asterisks are, are some new things that have been added here um, with, the, with the 2016 update to the ICH Group Clinical Practice Guideline. Um, the use of a risk-based approach for quality management systems. Uh, um, if you are gonna use a clinical research organization or academic research organization, if you're gonna transfer any duties, you need to write that down um, and have both parties sign. So making sure that all, any trial-related functions that you're transferring are, are you know, specified in, in that written document. Um, and also, again, was added here is that, that the sponsor is still responsible to oversee all of their trial-related responsibilities, even if they subcontract out to a CRO or to an academic coordinating center to manage that study, they are still responsible for overseeing all of those responsibilities. Uh, medical expertise as a sponsor, you need to designate um, appropriately qualified medical professionals to advise on any trial-related questions. This is usually a medical monitor that is set up for a study um, that can answer any medical questions that come up. The sponsor is responsible for trial design and management. Um, so utilizing qualified individuals. And when they talk about qualified individuals, this is where we, we collect regulatory documents. We wanna show that people are qualified um, by both training and education. In all aspects of trial design, those people should be qualified. Um, in managing uh, the trial and the handling of data, um, and one of the new, um, guidelines that was put in in the 2016 update was that when you're using a computerized system, um, you have to have a, a validation approach based on, on risk assessment and maintaining SOPs and ensuring data uh, integrity as well. The sponsor is also responsible for selecting sites and contracting with sites. Um, so it's very important that 
you know, as a, if, if you're going to be a sponsor or you're going to run a study, um, to make sure that you're selecting trained and qualified investigators, um, making sure that they have the, the patient population and making sure that, you know, you're choosing them because they're qualified and they can actually enroll in your study. Um, and then you also will need to have some type of a contract put in place with those, um, with those sites if they're going to be participating in the study. Um, for regulatory submissions, the sponsor is responsible for submitting regulatory um, applications to the FDA if, if it's so warranted. Um, they also need to confirm that each site that might be participating in that study um, has undergone IRB review, um, so obtaining the name of the IRB that they're using, their address, there's a federal-wide assurance number that has to be obtained, um, and any letters and any documentation that's been submitted to the IRB. Um, the sponsor is responsible for, for maintaining all of that documentation, as well as the site. Um, the sponsors are ultimately responsible for an investigational product. So if you're new, using a, a product, a, a drug of any sort, or even a device, um, the sponsor is responsible to provide that information uh, in an investigator's brochure. So any new information that comes up, um, they need to make sure that that investigator brochure um, is updated and provides the full information to all of the investigators involved in the study. Um, the Sponsor is also, you know, obviously going to be responsible for manufacturing, supplying, or handling the investigational product. Oftentimes, when this is done by a, an academic investigator, these responsibilities are transferred to, um, you know, central pharmacy or a manufacturing firm to make the product. But again, you'd be responsible for making sure all of that um, is done well and, and by good, good laboratory practices as well. Um, so maintaining all of the documentation about that, making sure that there's enough drug for both, you know, timely delivery and resupply. Um, so making sure that there's enough drug to carry you throughout the entire study before beginning a study um, and making sure that if the, if the study is blinded, that there's a system in place to main, maintain that blind um, with the study drug. So making sure that you can't, you know, physically or um, either by taste, physical um, sight, be able to see the difference between the, the placebo and the active drug. One of the key things. Um, in terms of safety, so the sponsor is responsible for ongoing safety evaluation. Um, they need to promptly notify investigators if they're, as well as regulatory authorities, if there's any finding that could adversely affect subject safety about their product. Um, an adverse drug reaction reporting, so they need to report to um, the FDA, any adverse drug reactions that are both serious and unexpected, um, and they also need to submit periodic safety reports um, to the FDA requirements. Sponsor is responsible for monitoring of the trial, um, so again, ensuring that the trial data is accurate, um, complete, and verifiable, and that, it's con that the data was obtained and that the trial is being conducted um, you know, in compliance with both the protocols as well as all the regulations and good clinical practice. This is an area, as you can see in, in the red noted, that was really updated in the 2016 um, update to the ICHGCP guidelines, um, very much focused on risk-based monitoring and making sure that it's very clear, you know, how to set up a risk-based monitoring um, um, plan for each trial to make sure that it's, it's both, you know, centralized monitoring and it's done very efficiently um, to document how that, how that system is set up. Sponsors are also responsible to, to look for noncompliance um, and to act quickly when there is noncompliance. Um, they have the, the responsibility, really, to terminate an investigator's participation if there's consistent noncompliance. Um, and, you know, they have to make sure that they're, they're really looking for these both in audits and then in monitoring that happens. And again, there was a, some update to this in the 2016, um, and really just talking about how important it is to follow up on noncompliance. Um, it can really affect both, you know, patient safety and checking patients, as well as, you know, really the reliability of the trial results. And really, the FDA and, and the regulatory bodies are looking for root cause analyses and looking how we can how we can implement um, plans into um, 
to alleviate noncompliance in the future. So that's sort of one of the key points that sponsors have to think about. Sponsors are also responsible for, you know, if there's going to be a premature termination of a study, um, to notify everyone notify all of the investors that are participating as well as um, the regulatory authorities and explain why this, the study is ending prematurely um, and how they might take action and inform their IRBs of that. Um, and the sponsor is responsible for doing a clinical trial report. Um, so basically preparing a report to the regulatory agency um, after a study is completed um, or once it terminates to provide the results. Multi-center trials are, are um, a challenge, and that's what you know, Dixie and I mostly deal with, with multi-center clinical trials. Um, and the most important thing there is looking for consistency across multiple sites. Um, so again, the guideline really describes this as one of the sponsor responsibilities, that if they're conducting a multi-center study, making sure that there is compliance. That's why we do so many meetings and, and um, do some training to make sure that there is consistency across sites. We make sure that their um, case report forms, the way the data is being captured across all sites is the same. Um, and it's really important to document all of that prior to beginning the study. And then again, having ongoing communication with the investigators um, and making sure that that gets facilitated. So I think I'm gonna switch out to Dixie now and who is gonna talk about the investigator obligations. Dixie, are you muted? I think you might be muted, Dixie. We're not hearing you. Joy, is there a way to unmute Dixie? Yeah, I'm looking for her here. One moment. Okay, try that. I think she muted. There, am I unmuted? Yeah, so we can okay. hear you now. All right, so it has quite a lag on it. So. And of course, I was clicking away at it madly. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about investigator ob obligations. Um, Mary Ann's kind of laid it out nicely as to uh, uh, what the sponsor obligations are, but probably most of you who are listening today will be uh, involved from the investigator side. So you need to know what your responsibilities are. Uh, next slide. These responsibilities are laid out in uh, 21 CFR 312.60. And of course, the first responsibility is to protect the rights, safety, and welfare of study subjects and to ensure that all the applicable regulations are followed. There are federal regulations, there are state regulations, and there are local um, regulations. Um, safety would be the first uh, priority that you always must uh, keep in mind when you're participating in clinical trials but then uh, following the regulations and controlling the, the drugs or the devices that might be under study. Um, most, if not all, of these requirements are listed on Form uh, 1572 to the FDA. Uh, next slide. You may have been asked to complete one of these before, but this is the investigator responsibility form that the FDA requires for any clinical trial that's regulated by FDA. Um, there are some additional, uh, there are pieces here that inform the FDA about the trial, where it's being performed, who's performing it. Um, the first highlighted circle on the left is uh, name of sub-investigators. So there will be the PI and then sub-investigators sub who would be involved in the trial conduct. And then the commitments are listed over on the second page and with reference to each of the regulatory um, components that uh, address those commitments. And um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you should read those uh, every time you complete one of these forms, but often um, investigators kind of lose sight of what they're committing to when they sign up to be the investigator for a trial, either a multi-center trial or a single center trial. Next, next page. Next slide. There we go. 
keep calm and take responsibility. Um, there are a lot of responsibilities in trial design, but it's important that uh, uh, you, you uh, uh, re remember what your commitments are and continue on. So the FDA guidance, um, first of all, addresses um, providing reasonable medical care for any study subjects who are involved in the, med in the uh, study intervention. So in addition to performing research, there also needs to be reasonable med medical care, um, particularly if there is an adverse event or a problem that occurs. Um, so in, in that vein, we need to make sure that there's reasonable access to medical care. And next point is to adhere to the protocol so that um, subjects aren't exposed to unreasonable risks or, or um, problems that might occur during the conduct of the trial. Um, some examples of this are failing to adhere to the inclusion exclusion criteria. For example, if you would enroll a subject who had renal failure, um, where that is an exclusion criteria and perhaps the investigational drug is nephrotoxic, so um, you, it's important and tantamount that you adhere to the protocol um, to protect the safety of the human subjects that are volunteering to participate in your research trial. Another example of failure to adhere to the protocol is omitting a safety measure, um, such as checking uh, CBCs on a routine basis um, in the, when the investigational agent might cause neutropenia. Um, and an additional um, guidance from the FDA is for the site investigator to inform the subject's primary physician about their participation in the trial. Um, depending on what type of trial you're participating in, you might be their treating physician. Um, we try to keep as separate um, uh, as possible from the treating physician to the um, investigational physician. But um, at the very least, um, if you are um, not the treating physician, or the primary physician, you would want to inform the, um, that person so that they can um, agree to the, uh, the medical care that might be impacted um, while they participate in the trial. Next slide. So the FDA does allow for delegation. Um, you can delegate tasks, but you cannot delegate the responsibility. And that is probably the biggest lesson we can um, learn from this particular presentation, if you sign a 1572 and agree to be a principal investigator of a trial, you are the responsible person. There are many, many people that will help you out with that trial, but um, ultimately it will fall to your feet. Um, so even uh, when you delegate tasks, the investigator is still responsible for choosing qualified individuals to perform those delegated tasks. And this is the part where a nurse coordinator or a uh, research coordinator can be uh, very instrumental in um, achieving all the tasks that need to be done um, in a clinical trial. Um, in addition to choosing qualified individuals, uh, the FDA requires that those, those individuals have adequate training for the delega delegated tasks and that there's adequate supervision and oversight. Um, and all of, these are, um, all of these tasks and persons are laid out in the delegation log. Um, people call it the, the, the delegation log, the dele of responsibility log, the DOR, um, you'll hear all those terms thrown around, but that's where you're telling the FDA who is performing what tasks on the trial and, um, and how they are qualified and trained to do those particular tasks. Um, uh, some things that are inappropriately delegated that have been identified by the FDA include um, a medical history or assessment of IE criteria. Uh, or screening evaluations uh, essentially performed by people who are not qualified to do that, um, particularly if it's a complicated medical disease um, or a complicated medical trial. So um, people without um, licensure, um, that also applies to physical exams, those need to be performed by licensed people. Um, evaluating for AEs, um, these can be screened for by coordinators, but um, to truly evaluate them, that needs to be uh, an investigator or sub-investigator who's on the trial to determine whether you know that really is an adverse event that has occurred and um, should be described to the FDA as part of the uh, portfolio of that particular drug. Um, and assessing the primary endpoints. Um, since I work from the data coordinating side, um, that this is usually the biggest uh, issue that we're um, trying to deal with and make sure that we have absolutely accurate data about um, whether the primary endpoint was met. Um, if the primary endpoint's death, that's relatively simple. If that's 
things like progression or things like um, a more subjective outcome like um, EDSS, um, then you know it, it can, we have to really refine those definitions and make sure that the, the investigator who's reporting that has a clear understanding of that um, and has um, performed that by a qualified person. And of course, obtaining informed consent. That needs to be someone who's um, who had, has been delegated that task appropriately and has the responsibility and knowledge to uh, deliver that consent to the participants in a way that they are informed about what they're being asked to do. The investigator is accountable for regulatory violations resulting from failure to adequately supervise the conduct of the clinical trial. Next Hi, slide. Dixie. Uh, yes. This is Gan from Iowa. I have a quick question about that. Mm -hmm. so, is it possible, or can, are we allowed to dedicate someone to obtain consent or not? It depends on your IRB, um, and that's part of your application. Different institutions handle this differently, um, but if, you're, if you identify who those people are and they are appropriately trained and qualified in the eyes of your IRB, then yes, that can be delegated. It okay, so it's totally up to IRB. Yeah, it typically depends on the complexities of the trial. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Okay. Oh. So, um, adequate training. To address that, um, what, what needs to happen there is that uh, the staff who are going to participate in the trial need to be familiar with the purpose of the study and the protocol. Um, the details of the protocol. And it's the investigator's responsibility to ensure this. Um, it's also um, that the staff need to have an adequate understanding of the details of the protocol and how to perform their assigned tasks. Um, do they need particular training if they're, you know, you know if they're doing FECs or um, uh, EDSS or whatever outcome measures they're working in? Um, have they been trained and do they understand um, how to do those tasks? Are they aware of the regulatory requirements and the acceptable standards? Um, any NIH funded and almost any other trial is going to require that there's some human subjects training that's documented for any staff participating in this study. Um, and NIH funding also requires a GCP training, um, which you are getting right here, right now. <laughs> um, and there are other uh, different ways uh, to do that as well. Um, the investigator, investigator also needs to make sure that the staff who are delegated to do the tasks and assessments are competent and um, that they're informed of any pertinent protocol changes. So um, that all needs to flow through the investigator and uh, come up with ways to adequately train the staff to make sure that um, they are um, achieving the results of the trial um, appropriately. Next slide. And the way you do that is with adequate supervision. Um, the, the investigator needs to have time, and that is probably the biggest uh, uh, issue that investigators deal with, but um, and there are ways to leverage your time. But um, again, um, there are several uh, factors that the FDA have, have identified through audits on ways that investigators are having problems with adequate um, supervision. First is inexperienced study staff. Um, I mean, you know, you know it, it's easy to blame the coordinator, but it's also um, the responsibility of the investigator to make sure that you have an appropriately trained person who, with enough experience to um, perform whatever duties are uh, required for that particular trap, that particular trial that you might be participating in. Um, there can be very demanding workloads. Um, there can be very complicated clinical trials. Um, there could be a large number of subjects enrolled at a site. Um, uh, and things uh, just don't quite line up in the stars properly so that, you know, too many visits are happening on certain days, the visits are long, the subjects are ill, um, uh, acute trials are extremely complicated to perform because um, there, there's, the timing is essential, and, um, but there are also a lot of competing, um, obviously, very important things that need to happen with those trials that, um, in the acute populations. Um, other factors that can affect the ability of an investigator to supervise appropriately are if there are multiple trials being done um, and or if you're conducting a study at a remote uh, location. Next slide. Um, a good uh, exercise, and you know this might seem kind of pedantic, 
but develop a good supervision plan so you know exactly what's going on at your site and what your responsibilities are. Um, it, a routine meeting with the study staff weekly about, you know, okay, who's been enrolled, where are we enrolled at, um, what kind of protocol updates have, have gone on, what kind of AEs have we seen, what kind of AEs are being reported as, to us by the sponsor, um, what should we be looking for. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, that's just a communication tool that is extremely valuable, um, does not necessarily need to be, you know, minutes taken and all those kinds of things, but make sure the appropriate action items that come out of those meetings are documented and that there's follow-up on all those things. Um, if you identify that, you know, you have an AE that needs to uh, be sent to the sponsor, what's the follow-up on that, who's completing it. Um, Part of that is by knowing in your delegated tasks um, who is responsible for that. So identifying that on your delegation log and making sure those people are appropriate. Um, you need to make sure you have a, a proper procedure for ensuring consent. Um, there can be checklists, there can be a narrative note, um, that, you know, depending on which what IRB you're working with. Um, at uh, University of Iowa now we use a kind of a lay summary that goes along with the um, uh, informed consent form for subject uh, comprehensi com comprehensibility. Um, you also need to have procedures in place to ensure that the source data are accurate. Um, source data is what verifies to whatever is entered into the CRFs or the electronic database. Um, someone will be coming along, the study monitor, um, probably to verify those things, or there will be someone um, calling on the phone asking about um, those particular uh, questions where things don't quite match up or there's some kind of logic that's not adding up within the database. Um, and, you know, data accuracy is uh, the hallmark of a good trial, uh, making sure that all of, the, all of the data is entered, that there's very little, if any, missing data. Um, and because all of that leads to the primary endpoint and the analysis, which in the end, um, if, uh, if there's too much missing data, then the trial can fail just for that particular reason. Um, and if the data is inaccurately reported, the trial can fail for that reason as well. Um, and finally, there needs to be a procedure for addressing medical and ethical issues that arise during the trial, um, working with the sponsors, the IRB, uh, a medical monitor, the DSMB, um, whoever um, is involved in your per particular trial um, to help address medical issues and ethical and ethical issues. Next slide. Once again, you are responsible. <laughs> um, next slide. So um, you uh, agree to participate in a, in a trial. You've signed the 1572. The contracts are moving through. You've got IRB approval. Um, and uh, uh, one step that uh, you may ha have participated in the past or not is uh, site selection. This is uh, especially for multi-center trials. So there can often be a pre-selection uh, site questionnaire that's sent out. Um, it, um, since Marianne and I work in uh, Neuronext and other um, consortium kind of trials, um, we've seen a lot of these. It's really important that you fill these out as accurately as possible because it, it uh, speaks to the feasibility of the trial and you might very well be held up to um, what you are um, indicating is going to happen. Uh, so the first thing here is number of patients that you have in the clinic that might be eligible. Um, you know, there's kind of a rule and thumb that, uh, that you know, there's at least at best, maybe 50% of the patients they think they will get will get enrolled um, or even 30%. <laughs> but, um, I think, you know, there, there are a lot of tools now that help people um, uh, in EPIC and um, uh, through different databases that might be set up at your institution to really get a good idea. And then, um, and then talk about the people who are, with the people who are actually dealing with those populations, um, uh, particularly if you get to rare diseases or uh, things like that where, you know, um, whether you think those, uh, the, people who appear to be eligible on paper would actually consent to participate in the trial as it's written. Um, uh, you, you can also have a, a good idea then of how many would fulfill the, uh, the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, you would need to talk about if you're using your own IRB, what the process is and what timelines you could uh, predict uh, for your IRB. 
the contracts process and the experience of, of yourself and any of the coordinators that might be working with you. Um, and again, accurate information, reasonable estimates, and responding quickly to the questionnaires are things that will help uh, get you selected to be a site in a multi-center clinical trial. Next slide. If your site is selected, then uh, there's typically a site activation checklist that needs to be completed before you are allowed to start enrolling patients at your site. All of these things are typically required before anybody starts enrolling uh, patients. Uh, first is the contract, um, fully executed. That can take three months or more. Uh, second is the IRB approval um, of the protocol and the informed consent. Um, that can take three to four months or longer. Um, you know, all of these depending if you're working within a consortium where you already have contracts um, and reliance agreements. Um, if it's a single center, um, you know, it, it's hard to say exactly without knowing specifics of trials, but um, the take home message here should be, it does take a few months to get these things done. Um, so uh, you need to have uh, your signature on the protocol and on the investigator's brochure. Uh, there needs to be a signed and dated 1572, that investigator responsibility document that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, there needs to be financial disclo disclosures for any of the study staff who are um, indicated on the 1572. Um, you're probably required to produce an IRB membership list. Um, and an FWA from your local IRB. Um, there needs to be human subjects training. Um, often people use CITI, CITI, um, to accomplish that goal. Um, whatever your institutional requirements are, you probably, um, by fulfilling that, um, you would fulfill most um, federal kind of requirements. Um, and then whatever training um, before you can participate in the study. Um, uh, training on the protocol, training on the outcome measures, um, how to perform the outcome come measures consistently across different centers and training on the electronic data capture system. And then there might be an investigator meeting that you're asked to attend where all of these things are reviewed as far as the trainings, the protocol, the analysis. And uh, there also might be a site initiation visit where the sponsor or the designees actually come to your site and um, uh, perform all their checks to make sure that you're ready to go. Next slide. So you've done site initiation, your site is activated, now you're ready to enroll. Um, there's a few things that are important to understand when you start enrolling patients um, to, to be in compliance with GCP. Um, first, your recruitment tools. Um, you can't, uh, you are not allowed to just make up your own recruitment tools and hand them out um, freely within your clinics. Those all need to be IRB approved. So anything that's in contact with the patients has to be IRB approved. This would be letters um, inviting them to participate in, this, in the trial or letters, um, you know, either cold letters or letters to patients that are known to you personally. Um, those all need to be IRB approved. Um, any website um, that advertises the trial, um, there is clinicaltrials.gov, but um, that's not directed to patients. So if there's something that says, you know, contact this person um, to participate in that trial, it needs to be um, uh, approved by the IRB. Um, and a lot of people have patient databases or registries that they use, and um, the IRB also needs to approve the fact that you're going to tap into that to contact people for your trial. Um, enrolling, uh, a big piece of that is consenting. Um, here we're talking a little bit about the, some of the basic requirements and principles of informed consent, um, information comprehension and volunteering. Those go back to uh, the Belmont report, I believe it is. Um, so you need to tell patients why are we conducting the trial, what happens in the trial, what are the risks, and what's the risk-benefit ratio, and then who's conducting the research and who to contact it. Um, most institutions have templated language that goes into this stuff so that you make sure you address all these things, but it all goes back to the principles uh, of informed consent, and those are have, have regulatory status, so it's important that you understand all of those um, as you put together your informed consent documents. Um, another important thing to remember about informed consent is that it's an ongoing process. Um, you, as an investigator, have responsibility to let um, any participants know of any changes or 
any new information that um, they should be um, notified of. Um, and a, a big uh, uh, benefit to patients is actually letting them know at the end. Um, and that's something I think that the community has not done well. Um, it's being done better now across studies, letting them know when you can, what the results are, um, so they don't just read it in the newspaper, um, and uh, letting them know what treatment they were on. Um, there is a point um, at the end when you can let them know if they were on drug or not. Um, the informed consent process um, also requires uh, written signatures, dates and times, and copies. Um, just making sure as you enroll people that you're in compliance with all those regulations. Um, there are a couple of tools you can use for screening and randomization, um, checklists for eligibility, and um, to, make, to uh, make sure that you have people. Um, so if uh, someone's doing your screenings, particularly like if residents are helping or, or um, coordinators or project managers, um, they're going through the checklist and finding um, people who are eligible but then the PI has responsibility to confirm those things and often a checklist with a signature um, helps uh, any of the sponsors understand and know that the PI um, did confirm that these people are ultimately responsible. Um, same with the randomization note. That's uh, part of GCP that you just include in the research binder or the medical record or wherever you're documenting um, that um, this, uh, the subject was um, properly consented um, all questions were answered and they were randomized um, on this date um, and um, that should be signed by the principal investigator. Next slide. So you, you get your patients enrolled, everything's going along, now you have some GCP guidance about um, how to do follow-up visits. Um, uh, these apply to you know, the protocol, the investigator brochure and the study monitor. Uh, there's an SOA or an SOE, Schedule of Assessments or Schedule of Events, that's usually included in any um, protocol. Um, it's important that you understand what the window is for those. Um, there are reasons why people put in um, certain visit dates and windows. So if it's a two-week visit and you have a plus or minus three-day window, um, that should help you get over weekends, holidays, things like that. But um, for safety, uh, those people need to come in and within window um, to get those assessments. Um, it also has to, to do with the outcomes and when they're assessed. And different protocols, depending on how they're written, um, if there are deviations from this, it might um, then it might not allow that uh, patient to be included in the per protocol analysis which can then lead to missing data, diluting the effects, um, not really getting an uh, answer to the question that you're asking. So um, pay attention to the SOA or the SOE. Um, uh, try to conduct the um, visits within window as much as possible. Um, do all the assessments that are requested and or required, um, but make sure especially that you pay attention to safety and get all of that information in. Um, and that could include labs reporting AEs or SAEs and any protocol deviations. Um, the source or the case report forms um, need to be clear and clean. Um, make sure you document everything that's happened. A little handwritten, you know, or, you know, in the, you know, typed uh, paragraph, you know, three sentences that said, patient called today and said that they had this event occur is invaluable <laughs> when you're trying to reconstruct um, what actually happened with this drug, with this patient, within this trial, and put all of that information together. But if it's not documented, it never happened. And you know, I know everybody knows that from their um, hospital training as well, but that applies in research as well. Um, you need to, uh, for a good GCP, keep your data entry up to date. Um, prepare for monitoring visits. Those aren't there to get you in trouble. They're there to make sure that we're all collecting and um, reporting accurate, clean data so that a, a good analysis can be done. Um, you will probably be requested slash required to meet with the monitor when they come to your site. Um, that's in one way to make sure that, um, so the sponsor can assure that there's appropriate supervision by the PI and that they are, you know, have oversight of everything that's going on in the trial and also to address uh, specific questions that might come up. Um, and it's also good to keep your grant manager in the loop um, as far as um, 
big institutions often have a hard time following the money. Um, so, you know, making sure that you're getting paid appropriately for the, um, uh, the work that you're doing is an important piece from the institutional side, for sure, as well. Next slide. So we've talked about safety first, um, adverse events. Um, this is certainly part of uh, GCP. Adverse event is any untoward medical occurrence that might occur. You always want to ask your subjects. Um, you want to volunteer. Yeah, the AEs might be volunteered by the subjects. It might be prompted with a few questions. Um, you might see something in lab results or a finding on a physical exam. Um, a lot of adverse events are reported with coding. Um, MEDRA or CTCAE, um, that's not especially important for you to know how that's done, but it's a way to group adverse events so that they can be analyzed a little better um, as opposed to, you know, the difference between a cough and a cold and a sneeze and, a, you know, all the different things that might um, code up to some one, uh, one particular uh, type of event that might want to be studied for that drug in that trial. Um, it's important to note the date and time and the onset and the resolution, what the severity is, whether it's related to the trial or the drug, um, and whether it was expected, um, which um, to be expected, it should be listed in the investigator brochure um, or in the protocol or somewhere in the documents as, as a known side effect as to what occurs with that particular drug. Next slide. Serious adverse event is all of the things above but it meets certain criteria, either in the view of the investigator or the sponsor. Um, and these are regulatory criteria. This is typical across all studies. Death, life-threatening hospitalization, um, or prolonging an existing hospitalization, um, uh, persistent or significant inability to conduct normal life functions, congenital anomaly, or an important medical event. The ones there that get discussed the most are hospitalization or pre-existing or prolonging. So if someone goes in for a colonoscopy and spends, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason, an 18-hour bed, um, does that count as a hospitalization and a, a serious adverse event? Um, there should be documentation to guide you on that or talk to your sponsor about that. And also important medical events um, that, you know, what could be important to one person is not important to another person. Um, so. Uh, the language that we try to use is whether it required an intervention to pre prevent any of the above happening, uh, life-threatening death, hospitalization. So um, an ER visit, um, some kind of long-term disability might apply to that. Uh, SAEs, you want to report to your sponsor within 24 hours and report to your site IRB within uh, whatever um, guidelines they provide to you and make sure you follow up on them. Next slide. Um, the third way to look at safety is through labs. Um, it's important when you look at labs to whether you determine whether those are clinically significant. Um, uh, some, the CTCAE can help with that or other tools that the sponsor might provide you with. But those include things like, um, uh, you know, so is it two times normal? Is it a life-threatening value for a potassium? You know, those kinds of things. Um, uh, the ones that get a little more difficult to characterize are things that are, you know, well, their white count was 10.2, you know, um, is that a clinically significant event or not? Um, and protocol deviations also might affect subject safety, so it's important to um, understand when those need to be reported. It's not a, um, people tend to think of that as a ding on their site if they have deviations. Um, but it's really a way for the sponsor and the data people to know exactly what went on and how to analyze that data. So it's, it's very important to report them appropriately. Um, uh, things that can affect subject safety are missed or delayed assessments, missing um, inclusion exclusion criteria, um, missed stratification um, if uh, uh, the wrong information is entered and then the patients get uh, stratified and randomized into the wrong group. Those things can affect trial and uh, integrity um, and uh, drug accountability. Um, it's important to keep a log of all protocol deviation. Next slide. Okay, you've been through the study. Um, everything's completed. Uh, you're ready to go into site closeout. Um, next slide. 
next slide. Okay, this really is the last thing that you're going to have to do. No way, you might have to do more with the publication. <laughs> so record keeping and retention um, are important as part um, and part of the regulatory status in 21 CFR 312. Um, this is also part of um, good clinical practices that you keep adequate records on what has happened with the drug um, and that you keep case histories of every participant who's, who has um, participated in the trial, which includes the um, the source documents, the case report forms, um, and the regulatory binder. Next slide. So our take home messages are that the site investigator takes overall responsibility for the rights, safety, and welfare of study subjects, um, that the task can be delegated to qualified individuals with appropriate supervision, that responsibility cannot be delegated, and if it's not documented, it never happened. Always keep safety first, and always maintain good communication with the site staff, the IRB, the study monitor, and the trial sponsor. Next slide. What happens when an investigator doesn't follow these guidelines and regulations? Um, human subjects are placed in jeopardy or harmed or could be harmed. The public uh, gains distrust of the whole clinical research community. An investigator can be restricted um, or debarred from any future um, participation in FDA um, and NIH uh, funded research. An institution can lose an FWA, their federal wide assurance, um, and lose their federal funding. Uh, a lot of this happened in the 90s, um, so this stuff does happen, um, and uh, you don't want to be the person responsible for, uh, for bringing that down. Um, there's also FDA audits. Um, these happen um, uh, on a routine basis at all institutions, but you don't want your study to be the one that gets the Form 483 which is um, a, a very black box kind of warning uh, that goes to an investigator um, and an institution. And final slide. Um, this is Marianne mine's favorite final slide. Everybody has a different look at research, um, different ways uh, that you approach it. Um, all of these are right, none of them are wrong. Um, but uh, if you have good clinical practices in place and are able to um, uh, adhere to the guidelines um, and the regulations, which we know are extensive, um, but there are lots of ways and uh, places and people that can help you out with those things. Um, so be open to it and don't expect that uh, you're going to fully know the answers to all these questions um, because there are several different ways to look at these. Okay, are there any questions? There, there, there was just one in the chat box regarding, um, so, so we are not allowed to ask study teams to obtain consent or screen. I think that was early on. We are not allowed to ask who? Ask the study team to obtain consent or screen. <laughs> we, you are allowed to. They just need to be properly trained and they need, and you need to inform your IRB on and they need to give permission on who is going to be screening and who is going to be getting consent. We have one more minute. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Dixie and um, Marianne. I appreciate you guys taking the time to give us this great presentation. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please evaluate the webinar. Um, I put the link in the chat box, so please utilize that. And um, our next webinar will be on September 17th, so please um, be on the lookout for a reminder. Thank you very much um, to, to our presenters, and thank you everyone for joining us today.